Good evening. Welcome. It's so great to see so many familiar faces and some new faces. Um, I'm Rachel Manalter. I'm with School of Minds. And this program, STEAM Cafe, is put on um, a collaboration between Hay Camp, um, School of Minds, and South Dakota Public Broadcasting. So we just want to say thank you to all of our partners in this. This month, we have Dr. Kayla Pritchard, who is an assistant professor in our Department of Social Sciences, giving our talk. And I just have to quick say a little brag that she will actually be associate professor starting next fall. She received tenure just a few weeks ago. Um, at School of Minds, we really, um, we of course are very focused on our technical skills and education, but it's also very important to us to have a Department of Social Sciences and Humanities so that students can get that holistic education. And that is what Dr. Pritchard brings to our campus. Um, her research has been um, going for a year and a half in the double mothers, correct? But she's also looked at the general roles of mothers and, and their place in our society. And so her research is really fascinating. So I'm just excited for her talk tonight. So I'll hand it over to you. Help me welcome Dr. Pritchard. Okay, okay, that's better. But now I'm much more limited in how, I can, how much I can talk with my hands. And so that's gonna throw me off a little bit. Um, I get very emotive in class sometimes. So thank you for coming out tonight. Um, as Rachel said, my name is Kayla Pritchard, an assistant professor, associate in the fall of sociology. Um, just to give a, a kind of what it is I do, um, as a sociologist, sociology is study of people and groups. And so I tell my students, again and again, the individual exists within a social, cultural, historical context. And so this work is really exploring kind of motherhood in that socio cultural historical context and what it means. And so one of the first questions when I started this work um, is, what is a mother? What, what does that mean? How do we know? Um, how do I know if I am one? What am I supposed to do if I become a mother? When I become a mother? Um, and so as a good academic, what do you do? You go to Google. Right, so you Google. So if you Google mothers, these are just the first three lines of images that come up. So in studying kind of cultural attitudes and beliefs and expectations about a particular role, a study of these images is going to reveal a lot of information. So mothers, uh, there's a lot of babies. Oh, I guess I can use my, my pointer, yeah, baby. This one specifically breastfeeding, breastfeeding, baby, baby, small child, small child, small child. Um, so from this, motherhood is, is babies, it's pregnancy, it's birth, it is by default then biological. And if I Google motherhood a little more generally, um, there's the same kinds of themes emerge. Pregnant belly, baby, 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 um, a little bit of clip art and the like and some, some sayings. Um, and it, on this one is really interesting that even like, this one up here starts out optimism at the top, shock, anxiety, wine and then love, and then more optimism. Um, and, and I like this one too, it says motherhood is weird, or this woman, I can't read that on that screen, read it on my laptop, um, I can't actually, she wants, oh, go to sleep, and then once the baby's sleep, she's saying, I miss you. And so there's this, still this undercurrent um, of motherhood is biological, motherhood is pregnancy, that's how you get to become a mother is to give birth to a baby. And even though there's a little bit of maybe the, the stresses with the wine and anxiety and a little bit of um, the, the oddness of being so frustrated with this little thing that won't be quiet but then wanting to hold it once it is quiet, the underlying message is that motherhood is biological. Um, what this sets is a cultural default 
setting for how we think about women as women, how we think about women as mothers, and what motherhood entails, what it does, what mothers do. Um, these ideologies are powerful. Right? They define women who aren't even mothers, young women. My college students get a question of well, when they get married, when are you going to start a family? When are you going to become a mother? Um, where you know mothers start pestering adult daughters to give me grandchildren, give me grandchildren, and the assumption with all of that is biologically children. And then all other women up to biological motherhood are judged. So if motherhood's the default, every other mothering or motherhood experience is judged against this default. And even adoptive mothers, women who have adopted children, are held to this. Even a woman given a, a baby to raise, and she raises it from that baby, um, is still that, that child still might be asked about their real mother. So realness equates to biology, where every other status is, is slightly less than, um, some more so than others. So I, I started into this research on motherhood long before I had a baby of my own. I started into the research on motherhood when I met my husband, um, almost uh, my now husband, almost 13 years ago. He had a daughter. And so I took on a mother-like role, but I wasn't the mother, I was the stepmother. <laughs> right? Um, she's 16 now, I've been around for 13 years, I've, I've raised her as well, but most of, of what I've focused on is the stepmother role. The stepmother is the anti-mother, she is the foil, she, is, she represents the fears that we have, the ambivalence that we have about biological mothers, because a biological mother in our cultural ideology is gentle, she's caring, she's nurturing, she's understanding, she will go to the ends of the earth for her kids. Stepmothers don't do that, right? Hansel and Gretel's stepmother wanted to cook them, right? Disney, right? Cinderella's stepmother is, you know, vindictive and evil. You know, Snow White's stepmother wants her heart in a box. Right? She literally wants to kill her stepdaughter. I like this show. Um, I don't like it, but right, there's this fun show on, on, on I think it's uh, A&E, maybe, of evil stepmothers, right? these violent, murderous women. And indeed, this um, movie that was on Lifetime last year, 2018, um, the, the father dies, and the children come home to you know, mourn him and bury him and sort out all the inheritance, and they have to fight the stepmother that wants to get rid of them so she can have all of the inheritance. And I think my stepmother as an alien is fairly self-explanatory. Um, so there's this cultural anxiety about the stepmother as, as the anti-mother, that she is everything that we might fear um, biological mothers to be. As a result, she's placed in a really difficult family role. As a woman, she's expected to mother the kids, to pack their lunches, give them baths, help with homework, communicate with teachers, doctors, friends, parents, and all of that. But yet, she's not allowed to do some of those things, or not allowed to do it in the way we culturally would expect a woman as a mother to be, because there's the children's real mother that is often in the picture. Um, as a result, stepmothers often feel very conflicted in their roles. They report conflicts with their spouses, conflicts with their stepchildren, uh, less enjoyment of their family roles, um, difficulties disciplining, and, and it's a really conflict-ridden role. So if you compare, though, in the literature, in studies of women and motherhood, that you are either, as a woman, you are either a mother, a real mother, a biological mother, or a stepmother. Um, a lot of studies, you are, you are one or the other, and I found these kind of two examples where they're often pitted against each other culturally, because if you're one, you certainly can't be the other. Um, the skeleton waiting for stepmoms to stop creating drama and telling lies. So presumably, since there's a skeleton, that's never going to happen. You're going to be waiting a long time. And this is coming from a, the biological mother's perspective, viewing the stepmother as you know, causing problems. And then from the stepmother's perspective, I'm not the mom, I'm just the mom that stepped up. That, that biological mother, she's shirking her duty. She's not fulfilling her responsibilities to her children, so therefore, I have to step in, take her place, and do what she can't or won't do um, because she's just crazy anyway, most likely, um, from that perspective. 
I did my dissertation work on different experiences of womanhood, motherhood, non-motherhood. I compared biological mothers to stepmothers. Um, I looked at a couple categories of, of non-mothers, women who didn't have kids, um, either by choice or not didn't have kids yet. Um, and when I started thinking about stepmothers and biological mothers, again, I found this, this either or. But what stuck out to me is there were some studies where, you know, on a study of stepmothers and their identity work and their experiences and their role, there was a, a footnote. Oh, well, of, of these 20 stepmothers, three of them also had biological kids. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Wouldn't that make them different? Um, or in papers on multiple partner fertility, so if, if a woman has children from more than one man through, through a, a cohabitating relationship or a divorce or a remarriage, um, women with biological and stepkids showed up there. But I thought, well, that's really interesting. So if, what, if they're not either or, what about women who are both? They were really ignored. I couldn't find anything about them specifically as mothers. Sometimes in the stepmother literature, never in the biological mother work. Um, so my thinking was something has to be different about women who are both. And so in my dissertation work, um, and a couple papers since, I've used this word to talk about these women, to identify them specifically as different, as separate from biological and stepmother. So double mothers, women with both biological and stepkids. Um, in my own work, they are different. I have a couple quantitative papers um, that I've examined these motherhood categories across different um, psychological outcomes. So double mothers seem to be more distressed. They have a lot more stress compared to biological mothers and even more stress compared to women who only have stepkids. Um, they have lower levels of life satisfaction, which is a kind of a qualitative assessment of how our life is going. It's not happiness. Happiness changes from minute to minute sometimes. Um, I have a teenager, I know that. But <laughs> life satisfaction is more, so how is your life going? Is everything the way you thought it would work out? These women are, have, have much lower life satisfaction compared to both biological mothers and stepmothers. Um, and in my work, that's, that's pretty much all I've found. I mean, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but there's really no work that specifically identifies them as a distinct category from both biological and stepmothers. So I've got this quantitative work that I've done. Um, what I wanted to do was some qualitative work. Quantitative work is great if you want kind of a breadth of information, a survey, um, and the quantitative work I had had 5,000 women in it, but I wanted some depth to understand, well, if, okay, they're different. Okay, they're, they're, less, they're less satisfied, they're more distressed, why? And the only way to get to the why is to ask, ask them. So for about a year, um, I interviewed women. I talked to them and to shed light on their experiences as double mothers, not just as mothers in general, not just as stepmothers, but as double mothers of having these two different sets of kids. Um, so I, I posted flyers at daycares around town, you know, think, okay, where are kids? Well, if kids, where kids are, moms are gonna be. And so I, I went to as many daycares as would let me post a flyer. Um, I tried to go through the public school I didn't have anything to offer to benefit the school, so they said no, and I said, okay, thank you for your time. Um, I posted on some Facebook groups. That was really useful um, to get women interested in, in talking with me. And all, I just had three inclusion, inclusion criteria. They had to be married, they had to have biological kids, and they had to have stepkids. That was it. Was, that was it. Otherwise, anything could go um, in these women. So I conducted in-depth interviews with 31 women all together, um, they lasted about an hour each, and we just chatted, and just talked about their roles. So, I don't know how well you can read that. I made tables. I have to do that as a sociologist. There's, right, I live on a tech campus. There's numbers. I had to give numbers to my quantitative data. So, um, remember there's, I have 31 women all together, and this is just some sample demographics, characteristics, average age of 31 years. Um, the youngest woman I interviewed was 23, the oldest was 54. Um, on average, they're a fairly educated group. Uh, over half, um, the vast majority had at least some college, an associate's degree, a good chunk had bachelor's degrees. Um, the vast majority were white women. Um, 
most were employed full time. Average, eight, the average length of marriage was a little over six years, but they ranged from women who were very newly married to women who had been married 24 years. Um, the family characteristics, they had out of 31 women, 2.42 biological kids. All of them, again, had at least one biological child. Some of them had four, all the way up to four. Um, the age of those kids went from zero. You know, I think the youngest was six weeks at the time I talked to, to their mother. And then the oldest biological child was 27 years old at the time. Um, there were 70 biological children altogether across all 31 women, and so you can see how the ages break down there, that most of the biological kids were under 10 years of age. Um, interestingly, 45% of the biological children of these women were shared with their husband within that relationship. 45% at least one child was shared, so maybe one child was shared and one was not from a previous relationship of that woman, or two were shared and one was from a prior relationship, so that was interesting. And then 10% of my 31 women um, did not have any shared biological children in their current relationship. Um, they had fewer stepchildren compared to biological, average 1.68, ranging from one to four stepkids. Their ages ranged from five years to 36 years old. Um, there were 52 total stepchildren in my, uh, of, of my women, um, and they were a little bit older, a bit 11 to 20 years old, whereas the biological children scaled a little bit younger. Um, and then I, I tried as best I could to simplify residency, and if you have any familiarity, personally or not, with custody, this gets messy really quick. So as, as much as I could simplify it without oversimplifying it, most of the step kids resided with their biological mothers. A significant portion um, had joint custody between the, the biological parents and then um, less so with different visitation patterns. Um, and so those are just some of the, the qualita quantitative demographics of what my sample looked like of the women that I spoke with. What I did with everything else that we talked about um, was what's called a thematic analysis. So I interviewed these women. I, about this size, I had a little fancy, um, awesome recorder, digitally recorded the conversations. I had a student, uh, an undergraduate student working with me at the time. She transcribed all the interviews. So now I have a text version of my data. Um, I read through all of those interviews multiple times, looking for commonalities, looking for patterns, looking for themes. So once I find a theme where, where they're, what they're saying I can group together, um, you read through them again, and you read through them again, and you see if they're sub-themes, or I thought these two were distinct, but maybe they're the same. I can group them under the same umbrella. So it's really just a, a keep reading, keep refining, and examining the validity of the data that's coming out. And so. Of that data, um, all of those pages and pages of data, um, these are the kind of four primary themes that I identified. That there was a lot of conflict with the biological mother. That makes sense. Um, you've got two women competing for the same children, for the same love, for the same kind of duties of motherhood. Again, culturally, the biological mother and the stepmother are natural enemies. Um, so that was not very surprising, very in line with previous work. I found a lot of ambiguity with the stepmother role that women didn't really know where they fit in with their family. Again, that goes back to our cultural um, views. Every little girl, every little boy, every little person knows what moms do. They know what mom does. Um, what does stepmom do? Most of these women I asked, did you always want to be a mother? Oh, yes. You know, from a young age, I always knew I wanted to be a mother. No one said, from a young age, I dreamed of being a stepmother. Um, it's not a, a role that young girls aspire to. Along with that, you know, it's, it's a highly stigmatized role. We still have a pretty negative view of remarriage, of step families in this society. Despite how common it is, about one in three people are a member of a step family in some way, shape, or form. Despite that normalness, they are stigmatized. We don't think they work as well. They are more dysfunctional. They're only temporary. Um, that they're harmful for the well-being of their members. 
And along with that, kind of under that, uh, there's this, there was this theme of a nuclear family model. So the, the myth of the nuclear family is that, well, once, if I'm a stepmother, once I marry my husband and his children, we'll just be this one big happy family instantaneously, like the Brady Bunch. Life doesn't work like that. Um, so women often were set up for failure be based on these idealized notions of what their family functioning would be like once they got married, once they, they took on these responsibilities. Um, so that's kind of the negative part of that theme, but the, the, the good part, the positive part was that in asking them to describe their family and asking them, well, do you think of your stepkids as stepkids? Do you use that word? They were vehemently, the vast majority of them, no, absolutely not. We are just a family, a normal family. So there's this pushback against that stigmatization, against those ex expectations or assumptions of dysfunction. Um, what I really want to focus on, I kind of I gave a brief synopsis of those. What I really want to focus on is this theme. Um, I put in my title the boundary work. Boundaries have to do with the lines we draw around our family members versus not our family members. If you had to think about who is my family, those are names that are going to be in that circle, and there's names that are going to be outside that circle. That's a family boundary. So that's one way we could think about boundary. Another way we can think about a boundary is through an identity of how we think about ourselves and who we are and the role that we play within our family. And so I want to talk about kind of the boundary of who's in my family and who's not, and then the identity boundary of how do I think of myself as a mother? Am I a mother, a real mother, or am I a stepmother? Or am I something different and unique? So. Um, within that theme, I, I pulled some quotes from the women that I talked to. Um, I do have names associated with these quotes. These are not the real names of the women that I spoke with. These are names that um, I created. So, um, so Ashley, age 30, she was married five years. She had four biological children. One of those children was shared with her current husband, and she had one stepchild. So one of the themes that came out within that boundary work of the identity, um, that biological kids are different. Than step kids. So women were very cautious, very kind of careful, but yet very firm that their biological children are different than their step kids. So Ashley says, you know, like I said, I do feel more closer with my kids than I do my biological daughter. Um, just because it was so strained at the beginning, I don't know how to, you know, if she, the stepdaughter, was being naughty when my husband was gone, you know, how was I supposed to discipline her when she's going to go tell her mom that I was mean to her? Because, and you know, but she totally leaves out the whole part where she was naughty. You know, so there is sometimes, you know, I do feel like I'm not as close to her. Maybe I won't ever be as close to her as I am with my own kids. Um, I'm hoping someday we can, you know, get past that. So within that, there's the separation of my kids and then my stepdaughter. So, and this one is interesting. Another sub theme came out was that was that discipline, with that ambiguity. The stepmothers, as stepmothers, women as stepmothers, weren't really sure where their line was. Could they discipline their stepkids? Um, would their husbands back them up? Would the kids run and go tell their biological mother that they had the evil stepmother um, being mean to them? So, they're trying to walk these boundaries between, I want to mother them and I want to love them and I want to care for them, but can I? Should I? Another, and this is big, but another really good illustration of that comes from this woman where she says, um, I, I think the feeling was incredibly strong with her stepson. You know, when he was younger and I loved him so much and like the desire to, I wish I could just take you and you could be my son. And then um, when I had biological daughter and I wish I could put it into words, years ago before I had my biological daughter, um, a friend of mine, she had her own daughter. And then her husband had two biological children as well. And she had told me that she doesn't love the two stepchildren as much as she loves her daughter. And I just thought that was so cruel and insensitive. I was like, I don't understand how that could be possible because I love my stepson so much that I don't think there's anything that could be compared to it. And then when I had my biological daughter, I understood. I'm not saying I don't love her. I'm not saying I, I have, so I'm sorry, I lost my place now. I'm not saying I don't love her more, but I love her differently. And I think it's because, you know, I grew her inside of me. She is a part of me. She, you know, resembles me. We're with each other every day. And I think if, if, it was a, if I was a full-time stepmom, that bond would have been different. But I think since they, this woman had two stepkids, are primarily with their moms, I think that bond is not as strong, obviously, as with my own daughter. So here, the, the primacy of biology that that's what made her a mother, that even though she had a close relationship with her stepson, when she became 
a real mother, a biological mother, that's the bond that took precedence, that was more important, that felt stronger compared to the bond that she had with her stepson. Um, again, reflecting those cultural ideologies of biological motherhood as being the one that counts. So I had these two quotes of, well, my biological kids are different than my stepkids, but there was also a lot of, but then they're not, that there's no difference between the biological and stepkids. Um, Susan said, and in fact, once every, one, every once in a while, people will, if anyone ever says, your stepson, I have to think about who that is. Um, and she was very clear in that her stepson was just one of her kids. Somebody asked her how many kids you have, she, without even thinking she would include him in that number, in that count of, I have four kids. She had three biological kids and one stepson. Um, and then the second quote I have up there from Stephanie, that she, the stepdaughter, I mean, she's always just been a kid. I mean, even like even the first like couple weeks that my husband and I were together and we're just dating, he would have to go into work. I wasn't working at the time. My boys would be at home with me, but he would still take our daughter to daycare and I would tell him, you know, you can leave her here. She's fine. I know what to do with a four-year-old. I've got this. She's just always been kind of mine. She's just been my kid. So while some women were very clear that their biological children were different, they were separate than their, their stepchildren, there were also women who were very clear that they were not separate, that they were just all their kids, that they loved them all, cared for them, um, and that those boundaries were blurred between their kids and they felt like they could mother all of them. Another sub-theme that came out um, within that primary theme was the, designate, the, the boundary between their feelings for their kids and then their behavior, their treatment of their kids. So. Margaret um, says her biological daughter is going to need a little bit more attention from us because she's six. But I remember one time when um, I don't know when her biological daughter was like saying something that the stepson did. I'm like, biological daughter, there's no need to tattletale on your brother. And at that point, stepson was like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Because um, I just think in his mind, maybe I would favor her because she's my biological child. But um, I really try to treat them both the same. Like they both have the same rules. They both have um, to do the same things. And so this woman in particular was one of those women that separated her feelings from her biological child to her stepson. But when it came to treating them different, that would reflect in her feelings, she was very adamant that she tried to treat them the same. There was an age difference between the kids, but respective of that, she tried to lay the rules out the same, the expectations um, identically for each of them because she didn't want her stepson to think that she loved her biological daughter more because of that biological tie. She wanted her stepson to know that she loved them both the same. Um, and in this quote, he was very appreciative of that. And a lot of the women in this category were very concerned that if they brought a present home for one kid, they needed to bring presents for all of the kids. Or if one kid got a present, they needed to mail their stepkids a present if they didn't live with them all the time um, and include their stepkids when they went and did family things, had pictures was one example one woman used, um, and just tried to include them in their family as much as possible because they were clear that, yeah, I might love them differently, not more, not less, but I want them to be included because they are family. Um, so that's that was nice and warm and fuzzy. The downside of some of that, the feeling different, is guilt. And so there were a few women who expressed guilt at those different feelings that they had for their biological and stepkids. Um, so Madison said, I was always like, if I dwell on it too much, because like a lot of times me and her, she was talking when her stepdaughter's mom got into it. I'm not going to lie. I didn't like her, the stepdaughter coming over because she reminded me of her mom. Like, I don't effing like your mom, and I have to see you to remind me. I've never told anybody that, but I just like those feelings have been gone now for a while. Like I felt bad for thinking that, you know, because I chose, I choose to be here, but I just, I couldn't help it. But yeah, it's been a lot better. Seeing her stepdaughter reminded her of how much she hated her stepdaughter's mother. And she felt guilty for that. Like, you know, as a responsible adult, I, I shouldn't feel like this. I shouldn't not like this child because of what their parent did. This child didn't do anything, but those feelings can be really real. They can be really powerful, especially if as a stepmother, you don't feel like you can have the role and the influence um, and the, the relationship that you want to have with your stepchild because their, their biological mother is not allowing it. So what does it all mean? Um, it's a little bit of, of that sub-theme. So I think from what I've found so far and what I've shared, it's no wonder 
that double mothers are more distressed. They have a lot on their plate. Motherhood is hard. I mean, just with one biological child, it's hard. And we've got a greater culture recognition that motherhood is hard, that it's not all roses and rainbows and unicorns, right? It, it, it is challenging at work, it's challenging at home. Um, and, and I would like to see from my work the recognition that for these women who have both these sets of kids, it's even harder. Right? Not that it, it's, you know, the motherhood Olympics where you have to prove this is, I'm, I have it rougher than you do, but a recognition that there's a lot of different ways to be a mother and they're all valid and they all matter. And that many of these women um, simultaneously challenge the cultural emphasis on motherhood as biological, but yet reinforced it with their, their discussions of my kids versus his kids. Um, so that was really interesting. And in the literature, that reflects um, Andrew Cherlin's incomplete institutionalization hypothesis, which says that for step families, for remarriage, we don't have those culturally defined rules or, or roles the way we do for mom, dad, brothers, sisters, grandparents. I tell my students, well, you know, what do you do with a step grandparent? And they, they don't know. Um, and that, that, that moment of, um, that's the incomplete institutionalization, that we don't have that cultural default for that role the way we do mom, dad, grandma. Um, that these women are living within and external to the boundaries of family life, that in many ways they are in it, they are the wife, they have biological children with this man, but yet they're on the outside when it comes to the other kids, um, some more so than others, but you know, what, what does that mean then about who they are as women, as mothers? Um, and through all of it, they make it work. I asked every woman I interviewed, if you had to change anything, would you, would you change anything? Would you do it all over again? If you knew then what you know now. And I think two said, I wouldn't have married him. Well, okay, you know, fair enough. They, they had a rough time. But that means 29 of the women I talked to said, I'd do it all over again. They gave little things they would have changed. I would have done a little more of that, maybe a little less of that. But... They loved their families, they loved all of their kids, um, and they were doing their best to be mothers, to raise good kids the way all parents want to do. And I wanna leave you with um, kind of one last quote. A family doesn't have to mean, um, you know, blood or by marriage or whatever. Family is just anybody that is close to you that cares about you. And I really like that understanding of family. And those are my kids, right? They're my, my stepdaughter and my son. Um, I fall into this, this double mother role too. And I, that's really what the emphasis I want to make from my work is that family is expansive, family gets complicated, but family doesn't have to be just blood. And I'd really like in my work to challenge that cultural default of family equals blood because for most people um, it means a lot more than that. So thank you. I'll take some questions. Yes. A lot of them, I didn't specifically ask that because I didn't have to. They were very much very volunteered. Well, when I, I grew up with a stepmom or I grew up with a stepdad, and a lot of the, their own parenting came from things they thought went well. Well, my stepparent did this, and so it worked. It made me feel included, and so I want to make sure I'm doing this with my family. Most of them were, well, my stepdad made me feel like it was less than his real kids, and so I want to make sure I don't do that. Um, but a lot of them did did have uh, parents who had been divorced and did have step uh, parents themselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. It, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, because um, I haven't, I'm still working through what this data means, and so from what I remember off the top of my head, I would say it had less to do with custody, although you know, time spent with someone matters for how close you feel to them. Um, it had more to do with the biological mothers and how involved they let dad and stepmom be in their kids' lives. Because there were some biological mothers that made that extremely difficult. 
And there were others that said, you know, come on over. Like, we're, we're all family. We're all here for these kids. Um, and the stepmothers that made it work worked with the biological mothers and you know, decided that, yeah, whatever petty crap happened between you or him or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's the kids now, right? That's over. Let's focus and work together. So, but that's really hard in a divorce situation. Yeah. Um, so the, you're talking about the, the dissatisfaction in the, the quantitative results I talked about earlier. Um, in that data, there weren't, that I, I, want, I, w I wish I could do that with that data, because that is not data that I collected. That was other people collected, and I just had to deal with what was there. And, and in many ways, it is, it is incredibly useful, but in other ways, it's, it's lacking on what I would have done personally. Um, there was a question, there is a question in that data that asks women, do you think of your stepkids as your own? Unfortunately, it, there's not enough of them that answered that question to have enough cases to work with statistically. So, I, that, and that's why all these, I have all these questions after looking through my quantitative data, thought, oh, how can I answer these? In some ways I can get at that with this. You know, there were a few women that I talked to that told me, you should go ask fathers next. Um, and I think that that would be fascinating to do. Right now, I'm still trying to work through some of this. Um, I think that the cultural roles around fatherhood are fascinating in that they've changed so much in the last few decades. Um, I think, though, for me, I've, I've been really fascinated with motherhood. We have a cultural idea of father figures we recognize that kids can have multiple father figures, whether it's a coach or a religious leader, when they're in their own dad. We don't have that with mothers. There's a little more territorial nature of motherhood of my kids. Um, I, I've toyed with, with fathers. I mean, idea of father, that sounded really weird. Um, I've, I've toyed with the idea of, of talking to fathers, so I think one of these days in the future. Anything else? Yeah. Um, more of just a stable variable because a cohabiting relationship where people are not married throws an extra uh, wrench in it. About 10%. So they still have a Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the stepchildren were on average older than the, the biological children of these women, but that's because the, their husbands had those children before that marriage began. Maybe I misunderstood the question. Yeah. were younger. The youngest one was five. Yes. Um, I mean, for the women, though, their own biological children could have been before, you know, existed before their current marriage, right? Because they themselves, some of the women were divorced, and they had ex-husbands. Um, there were a couple situations where the, the biological, the stepchildren were younger than the marriage. An extra wrench in things where there was an extramarital issue, thing, indiscretion that happened. Um, but even those women were very much in their families. They were, they were not, you know, they didn't turn tail and run. They made it work, and they're doing their best with their partners and with, with all of those children. It's oh. oh, my hands.
that's a whole other can of worms right there. Yeah. Yeah. Frank? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. There were, there were a few, I'm trying to remember, three or four of the women I talked to that had step-grandchildren. Because their stepkids were older, there was an age gap maybe with their husband, and he had had children younger, um, and so they had grandkids, and that that was an interesting identity there because they're not their biological grandkids, but they very much felt the grandma role, wanting to spoil, and and coddle and take care of grandkids as, as grandmas are wont to do. Um, so that was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Family is fun. <laughs> Mike? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, I think we're headed that way. Um, every fall when I teach my, my marriage and family class, I have students define family. And I don't know if I have one student give me a very strict biological definition of family. They're all very much, well, friends can be family, and they include pets, and they include um, you know, members that aren't biology or marriage. And so I think that it's going to get more expansive, more inclusive. Um, we'll see if kind of the policy around family and the laws around, you know, health insurance to inheritance um, expand with that. The 1950s nuclear family ideal is still really powerful, um, even though it was a historical anomaly in the scheme of things. Yes. Did you collect data on the careers of the stepmoms and the 